All right. Uh, it is my honor to welcome our speaker tonight. Her name is Laurie Frigoli. And yes, you guessed it. She is our local, <laughs> a very famous local person. She is our district attorney for Marin County. She's going to present a talk about honoring diversity in our community, embracing the power of collaboration. Now, as business owners, we sometimes struggle to reach a diverse variety of clients and associates, and this often leads to blind spots, it limits our perspectives on how we do business and who we are attracting. In this informative talk, Marin County's District Attorney, Lori Fregoli, will share some of the insights that she and her team have learned and incorporated to creating a more diverse and inclusive community, a community where collaboration, listening, and empowering voices and views takes precedence. Now, these practices have taken the relationship between community and local government to a whole new level. Just a little bit of background about Laurie. She is a lifelong resident of Marin County, and her commitment to public service began when she participated in a law enforcement ride-along program while attending Terra Linda High School. Now, throughout her career, Laurie has been a pioneer breaking the glass ceiling in law enforcement. Whilst attending law school, Laurie worked at the Marin County Sheriff's Office. Then in 1990, she became a deputy district attorney and more recently, district attorney for the County of Marin. She's won numerous awards for her service to the community, including the Jeanette Prandy Center's Champion for Children Award for her commitment to the youth of Marin the Outstanding Prosecutor Award also, as well gaining a reputation in the community for tr treating all people with respect and professionalism. Please help me welcome Laurie Fregoli. Take it away, Laurie. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here, even though we're not uh, next to each other. I, have, I just wanna say when my first meeting new meeting, when I went to Mill Valley, I, I left there and called my friend. I said, I have never, been with a group of people where I felt so welcomed and appreciated, even though I didn't know any of them. So I really want to honor you all for supporting each other and supporting women because um, that's what I love about this group. So I'm here to talk about a community collaboration, improving diversity in the County of Marin and my office and um, in our community, hopefully. And so the first thing I want to talk about is what is a district attorney? A lot of people don't understand what the district attorney does. And technically I'm the chief law enforcement officer in the county, but that doesn't mean I run out and arrest people. And um, I'm gonna share my screen now, would that be okay? Do I have to just push the button in? Did it work? Okay, somebody said yes. I see Stephanie's nodding her head. So yeah. um, thank you. So and the district attorney doesn't go out and arrest people. Um, we don't tell the police to go arrest people ordinarily, but what we do is review cases that come to us. And so there's a lot of scrutiny and um, discussion about law enforcement being biased and stopping people of color more often than other people and arresting them. And it's important for people to understand that the vast majority of contacts that citizens, including people of color, have with law enforcement don't come to my office. A lot of those incidents are traffic stops. And if it's a traffic stop and a person gets a ticket, ticket for speeding or having a headlight out or the kind of things that they could end up you know, acquiring a ticket and if they don't pay it, they'll end up in, in the court system, but they'll end up um, downstairs in the traffic court. They won't end up in my office. And so there's a lot of that contact that is really under scrutiny right now, especially in Marin. And so one of the things that the state has done is pass a law where police officers um, starting soon will have to document who they're contacting and what the race is of the people and why they're contacting them and provide that to the Department of Justice who will put that out on a statewide database. And so that's going to pick up that um, kind of the abyss of contacts in law enforcement that my office doesn't see. And so um, you already have your sheriff's department here and the Mill Valley Police Department and the Tiburon Police Department who are putting that data out onto, the, onto their own website. So if you live in one of those cities, you might wanna look and see what their uh, data, 
RIPA day. It's called RIPA, race involved people. I forget what the A is for, but it's a good thing to have to look and see what your local police department is doing, and particularly with people of color. So that's one little bit of um, information I'd like to pass along. But then my office, when we do receive arrest reports or people are arrested, that's where our duty comes in. And that's where district attorneys across the state have a lot of influence in what happens to people and how we touch their lives, particularly people of color. And we are all you know, painfully aware of how um, having an arrest or having a family member arrested can really cause devastating effects long-term on people's families, generationally in people's families. And those are people who might not be able to enter the workforce or have the kind of life they would have otherwise. And so it does affect the diversity across our community and has a compound effect. And so I want to make sure people really think about that in a mindful way when um, we talk about that. And so let me see, I think something happened in my, let me see, there's my slideshow. So this is uh, basically what I'm going to cover tonight. So we kind of covered who we are and what DAs do. And um, in our office, we have for the first time put a transparency portal on our database. And so people can actually see for the last two years, what are the race of people who are arrested in Marin, what police departments are arresting them, and what kind of charges they're getting arrested for, and how my office is prosecuting those cases. And again, that has a compound effect on the diversity in our community. And also by being transparent, we really hope that people in the community who, who might not have trusted the prosecutor's office before might think that, oh, I might wanna do that because I can affect a positive change in somebody's life and therefore hopefully improve the diversity in our office. So it's a statewide problem that um, statewide and nationally, there are very few prosecutors of color. And that's something that we're working on uh, in our office and on a statewide level, the elected district attorneys are also working on that. Uh, we have someone in our office who's very involved in that program on a statewide level, and I'll get to that in a second. But I actually know about arresting people and what happens to their cases because I was, as I was mentioned, a police officer for several years and I worked my way through law school while I was still working as a police department. And when I was a police officer, the culture was I'm a cop, you're not, I win, you lose. And um, that didn't matter if you were a person of color or not. That was the culture, the mindset that we were taught. And I'm happy to be on the other side of that because we've seen the devastating effects of that kind of um, opinion and culture, particularly with men in that business. So when I was a police officer and I would walk into um, any district attorney's office, and this happens to be the Marin County District Attorney's Office before uh, I was the elected DA. And so literally for decades, you would walk into the district attorney's office if you were a victim or a defendant who might be seeking assistance or a witness. And when you wanted to seek help, what are you gonna, what's the first thing you see when you walk in there? A bunch of white men. And there's one <laughs> lady on the bottom there uh, and that's Paula Kamina. And in 1989, she was elected to be Marin's first woman district attorney. But yet not one of our leaders has been a person of color, including until now. And so imagine when you really think about it, how a person that would make a person feel if you were a person of color going into the office of the DA asking for help, or if you were a victim who spoke Spanish, which until 2019, if you walked into our front office, we didn't even have somebody at the front desk who spoke Spanish who could help you if you needed that assistance. So we changed that because all these things are important. This is the trust we need to build in the community and we're never gonna get people to come to my office and even think about working there unless they feel welcome and trusted and understood. And sometimes the reality is that, for example, if we're doing outreach to the Hispanic community or to a black community, I might not be the right person to go try and instill trust with that community. I can meet them and talk to them, but to gain their ultimate trust, it might take someone of color. And we have to realize that 
and appreciate that and understand systemically why that's the case. And so uh, we work very hard at that and working with our community and explaining to people why we're out there. So when uh, Paula Camina became the district attorney, she made a lot of changes and it started with doing uh, things geared towards women, actually. She would have what she would have mentoring sessions with the women. She would have sessions where she would have people come in and talk to us about our wardrobe and how we could improve our wardrobe. And of course the men all poo-pooed that, but she was just trying to uplift the women who were in the office. And she would also take us aside and, and tell us how she understood how difficult it was to be in our positions. But there's one thing about diversity that is not always recognized, particularly in public safety positions, such as police officers and firemen. When you say you have an employee or a staff of diverse people, that doesn't just mean that you have women. And I see a lot of meetings with business people who say, oh, we have a very diverse group. We have hired 30% you know, women or 20% women and we had none before. But that's only half the problem because we still have to try and have our offices, particularly in my office, when we serve the community, we want our office to look like the community so that when people come in to ask for help, if they're a witness or a victim to a crime, or if we have to go to court with them, that they know that we represent and understand what they've gone to. So it's really important that we do our best to work with that. So the one thing that we have done is we do, we work with BIPOC communities in my office. We work with the district attorney's offices and other, office, other areas where there might be more people of color. We have joined the, um, our local chamber of commerce and we won uh, the first year we went there. People were so shocked that the DA's office was there. We won the best booth award because they couldn't believe all the diverse programs that we offered in our office. We um, are still lacking some district attorneys of color, but we have intentionally recruited throughout the state. We go to law schools, we go to the black students unions and talk to them. We go in the high schools and talk to them. We go to any diversity forum that we can. When there's events in our communities, we show up, we bring our diverse victim witness advocates who are women of color and also bilingual. And we reach out to people and let them know, hey, did you know that we did this? Do you know that we have jobs in the county where you could be an interpreter or help a victim? We collaborate for the first time ever with the public defender and our probation department because we all fill different roles in the justice system. So if somebody might be intimidated and think they'd never want to prosecute somebody and send them to jail, well, they might want to help them stay out of jail by being a public defender, or they might want to help them get better by being a probation officer. So uh, we have youth come through our office. We recruit students. We speak whenever we can, wherever we can, such as tonight or last night, I spoke to a women's group from the UN. And... Um, we speak about opportunities we have, and we never stop saying we are looking for interns. We are looking for our future leaders. We want to build a dream team for our office and for the community. So uh, we really try and work with students of color in, from any schools we can get. And we also try and stagger their life experience. So we try and get high school students, college students, and law school students. And we intentionally pair them with each other so they can mentor each other. And ultimately we've had some of the, they work all summer and ultimately we've had some of those students come back and obtain jobs with us or come to us and have us recommend them for jobs. So we do as much as we can giving that first hand experience with students in our office. And we make sure we take them to court we introduce them to the judges. We introduce them to interpreters. We take them to the probation department, the public defenders, and we take them out to the community to meet our community partners. We are very engaged with as many nonprofits as we can because that's where many people of color are seeking services. And I love hearing um, from Dr. Linda that you stagger 
your fees for people who might be are of color or who might not be able to afford your services. That is the ultimate example of equity. You know, people try and have you understand and explain there's there's equality and then there's equity. And that example that you gave of lowering your fees for people of color is the perfect example of the implementation of equity. So I honor anyone who does that. And to tonight's point, maybe anyone here could think about doing that in their business. Or maybe you could think about mentoring someone. So I know Sandy's in real estate. Maybe if she could find, find a group and have them go to an open house with her sometime and see what her job is about. I first became interested in law enforcement by uh, being involved in a ride along program with a police officer. So our libraries have great programs. Almost every department in our county uh, has a place where there's an opportunity for students. Every summer we have an uh, explorer program where youth get a stipend for coming and working within departments. So we have them working at our schools and in the library at Health and Human Services, working at Public Works, um, we, you name it, any of our departments in the county, we have youth in there every summer trying to expose them to the career ladders that the county has and also to the different opportunities you can find in the county, even if you don't have a college degree. So that's one thing that we're working hard at. The other thing um, that we've done is we have intentionally gone out in our hiring practices, as I said, to try and get recruit people of color. And the one thing that we have learned in the county is it's been very difficult to retain uh, employees of color. We have done an okay job of hiring them, but the county just had a meeting today and launched a two-year uh, diversity program intentionally in the county because they're realizing we're hiring people of color, but we're not able to keep them. And they have found through studies and talking to our affinity groups, it's because we're not mentoring these employees from the outset. So they come into a group and um, I forget some, someone said earlier, you walk into a room and there were all white people in there. So imagine if that's, if there's a person of color who's coming into a new work environment, you know, even just talking to other people of color in the same um, office or the same building, it's important that you mentor people and they, because of the trust that's built, that you, if you've shown you're a person of color and you survived your first couple of years in the county, that you can help mentor someone else to get there too. And the county has found if people, after six years, that's kind of the dividing line for when people decide to stay or sometimes move on. And so we're really looking intentionally as a county with a two-year program to really mentor our people of color and make sure that we lift them as much as we can and support them in county employment so that they'll stay long-term and again, improve the entire diversity of our county workforce. So we really support after-school programs. We really support um, our community in every way we can. We have started a gun safety collaborative with community partners from all over the county, including uh, religious groups, lost students and um, Brady and Moms Demand Action, groups that DA's office has never really collaborate with before. And uh, we're about to launch our community bulletin. And it's important that people understand what we stand for. So we have those factors on the left-hand side that we all stand for. And I think trust is a big one, especially in this day and time. But also we want people to see that we, have um, that was many people of color in our office and that our gun collaborative, uh, look at the color of the people who we have on this flyer here. These are people that we are community leaders who we deal with and work with and, um, sorry, I'm trying to close something here and um, work with as community partners. And so again, this is gonna improve the diversity in the county and the diversity of people who trust and work with us. On the right-hand side there, you can see the um, swearing in of the number two person in the district attorney's office, who is Otis Bruce Jr. And um, he has been in the office uh, just a few months shorter than I have. So between us, we have almost 60 years of experience. 
and we are committed to improving the diversity of our office and uh, that's his wheelhouse. He's in charge of our social justice programs. One of our other programs he's done, this is our probation chief on the right, a 20 plus year veteran of the public defender's office and Otis Bruce Jr. on the left. And he, uh, this is a program he devised to go into the schools and talk to children and youth about the career ladders you can find in the civic center. And the amazing thing about that is that uh, the gentleman in the center Liddell Dangerfield, uh, not only is he a man of color, he's also fluent in Spanish. So you can imagine when he is in a classroom talking to children and all of a sudden starts speaking in Spanish, it takes it to another level of interest. And that's really what we're trying to do is um, encourage and spark kids to, kids to um, join the Civic Center. So here, uh, to end my program, I just want to show you that we have changed. Sorry, I got to turn my phone down that uh, our front office, it used to look like the picture I showed you at the start, but this is what it looks like now. And it stands for the values and our commitment to um, diversity and inclusion. So the top left and right posters are from, um, right, not free, it's from Not In Our Town, which is an anti-bullying, anti-hatred campaign. The center picture is a picture from a woman who's take Lisa Christine. She is a nationally known woman who takes pictures of people who've been trafficked, either human trafficking by labor, sex slavery. Um, and she also uh, has actually met the Pope and had sessions with him and has um, taken pictures all over the world. And she's been nationally um, acknowledged for her pictures. And when I saw that and it said Inspire Unity, I got her to sign it for me. And I think it really speaks volumes about what we're doing in our office to improve diversity. Below that is a picture of myself and uh, Mr. Bruce. And then the other two pictures there are about gun safety and the importance of gun safety and particularly gun suicide because we're very concerned about that with our youth here in the county. So hopefully this has sparked some ideas for you on how you could, no matter what your position is, no matter what your job is, that you can inspire diversity and improve diversity, even if it's just one person at a time. So thank you. And that is my message for the evening. Appreciate you all. Awesome, Laurie, thank you. Do you wanna jump out of us? Uh, there we go, there we go, awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and awesome. we have a little bit of time if you wanna, uh, if anyone's got any questions, we kind of did go over a little bit. I did, <laughs> I forgot to turn my thing on when I started. <laughs> Rut row. <laughs> yeah, I know. I do want to say too, I had some of those faces behind me, but I did intentionally put this picture behind me tonight because it was taken by a friend who um, passed away. Um, she had colon cancer, but it. I listened to an a motivational speaker and he once talked about uh, millennials, the difference between millennials and old schoolers, for lack of a better term, and how sometimes millennials throw stones at uh, people who, and I don't want to categorize, but just for illustration, I will, that um, that sometimes millennial people and younger youth don't appreciate people who have had more experience and who are just older. And so he told the story kind of a, that I really resonates with me, which is why I have this picture in my office. And it is that, you know, the millennials, they rise so fast and they're so wonderful and they think they own the world. But if a storm comes, guess what falls over? If they're, they're like a bamboo shoot going up so fast. But when the storm comes, you know, what's, what is left standing? It's always the tree with the roots and the deep knowledge that, um, to me, I think that stands for institutional knowledge in a good way. And so I always try and remind myself that, you know, to carry everything that I know with me. So. That's why I put the tree behind me tonight. That's awesome. Awesome, thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, Claire. Yeah, um, uh, well, it's just an idea or a comment. Um, my da daughter did mock trial when she was at high school. Yeah. So I thought that would be a, a, a good way, a good link for you guys. Because I don't remember her saying that she went and toured the DA's office or anything like that. I know they did their final um, trial actually down there in, in the courts but yeah yeah what school did she go to she went to drake ah but, so but it's versus you know they do at the school you know there's versus all the schools are involved 
Right. And yeah. so that's yeah. what happens is different schools have different coaches. And yeah. um, we have had, I think, four or five different DAs uh, coach students from different schools. I think last, not Tara Linda, Marine Catholic, and we helped Tam once. So depending on where, what, who your coach is for that school, it, you may or may not get a chance to come into the DA's office. But that's a good point, Claire, because yeah. they're kind of, come here and practice they're one floor below us so that's a really great point that we can have yeah. in our yeah. office and, yeah and I remember because I mean not that they're not all going to turn out to be attorneys are they so right. realistic, realistically so but you know it to plant the seed in their mind that you know you, you could still be in, involved within the legal system right yeah and even, yeah and even in that program they part of the competition is they I don't know if they did it when your daughter was there they have the sketch artist, you know, how people come right. and yeah. do the, the pictures for television. They actually, yeah. have, that's part of the competition now. Yeah. So, and is then, it? Well, it wasn't, yeah, because she's 20 now. So to give you perspective, the time, yeah. time perspective, and she did it, and she did it as a freshman. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a great program. But mm -hmm. again, usually this is skilled, you know, really skilled kids do that. I don't think there's a bilingual mock trial yet. That might be something to look at. So, yeah. That, that Any be, other yeah. uh, questions, Angela? Yeah. Angela. Um, hey, Lori, great job you're doing over there, by the way. I'm so hey. glad I voted for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what is the statute of limitations to bring a case before the DA? It depends. Um, misdemeanors, it's one year. Mm -hmm. so most, cri most crimes now are misdemeanors and felonies are three years and then murder, it's forever. So, But sure. it really, it depends on the crime. Um, but most property crimes now have been reduced to misdemeanors, so it's one year, and it's from the date date of the incident to the time we file it. So, um, but in a lot of sexual assault cases, there's a longer statute of limitations because sometimes they're not disclosed until later. Mm -hmm. So most of the serious offenses, it's three years and sometimes longer. Uh, any one more question? I just want to say thank you, Lori. You did a fantastic job. Yeah. I appreciate all you Thank are you. doing to transform the community. Hey, we're trying. And it's just so fun to work with the nonprofits too. I would really encourage people to go to their fundraisers and um, two of those gentlemen in that one poster that I showed, um, the gentlemen of color are running nonprofits. One of them is the music one. The other one is actually has a program in Marin City, a summer program where he has, he teaches kids yoga and first aid and CPR, banking. I mean, he's got so many people that come in and teach the kids in there. So it's really inspiring. And once you go to something like that, you kind of catch, catch that spark and it stays with you. Fantastic. All right, well, I'm going to close out if there's no more questions. Uh, Lori, thank you so much. It was great hearing about what you're doing in the county and uh, thank you for leading the way, leading by example. And, um, and we have a lot to learn. We all do. Uh, yeah. So thank you. I'm going to just cut recording here.